Hello, and welcome to Artists in Conversation, brought to you by the Brandywine Workshop and Archives. I'm your host, Patty Smith. For those of you who may not be familiar with Brandywine Workshop and Archives, here's a little background. Brandywine Workshop and Archives has been a vital, diversity-driven, nonprofit cultural institution for 50 years. It is located in Philadelphia, its mission is to produce and share art in order to inspire and build bridges among global communities. BWA has several ongoing programs. It funds, it funds short-term residencies for artists to produce limited edition original prints. It works to bring art to, of diverse cultures to institutions and communities through exhibitions and by establishing satellite collections across the country. BWA offers internships to Philadelphia high school and undergraduate college students who are majoring in art or a related field. And its latest project, called Artura, is a free, interactive, digital archive of culturally diverse art that gives educators and students access to information and images representing contemporary cultures and traditions from around the globe. You can access this unique website by registering at artura.org and you can find more information about Brandywine at their website, brandywineworkshopandarchives.org. As part of its residency program, Brandywine had uh, artists participate in Artists in Conversation. Formally, it was an in-person interview, but now the conversations are being brought to you virtually. Let me introduce today's guest, founder and executive director, Alan Edmonds, who is here to give you more insight into Brandywine and the activities of this most unusual year of 2020. Hello, Alan. How you doing, Patty? Good. Welcome everyone to this conversation we're going to have uh, between Patty and myself. And I, I want to thank Patty for uh, agreeing to be our host. Uh, I'm excited that we can continue this series. As Patty said, in the past, it's been in the gallery. Uh, we've had lectures, we've had panel discussions uh, under the, uh, the name of Artists in Conversation. Uh, because it's now converting to virtual, we also hope to bring you conversations that can happen within the artist's own studios, as well as the Brandywine studio. So uh, I thank you all for joining us and I hope you'll continue to follow us as we plan these events every uh, month going forward. So um, Alan, let me begin with this. Can you update us on recent developments in the workshop and with the programs? Yeah. Okay, uh, we prepared this PowerPoint and uh, I want to share, uh, we're mainly focused in this conversation on what's been happening at Brandywine over the last year during the pandemic. But in doing that, I want to first put into context what we're doing in the uh, artist residency program. Uh, a few years ago, we decided that we would, in order to extend and expand the opportunities in the program, we would enlist the services of local master printers. Philadelphia is very fortunate. It is rich in individually owned and operated print workshops by several master printers. In these two slides, we're looking at the one on the left, which is by Willie Cole, a very well-known artist in New York City. Um, and it really uh, tells us the impact that digital media and tools have had on printmaking. Both these, in fact, do. Uh, this one by Willie was conceived to look at an iron, a steam iron, and he saw in that, like Willie likes to see potential in a lot of uh, common uh, used popular uh, items. Uh, he's, as you know, he's done things with shoes and water bottles and ironing boards and things like that. And so he envisioned that you could take a diagrammatic uh, drawing of a steam iron and turn that into what would look like antiquities. And so in a way, this represents the transatlantic slave trade and the transposition from one culture to another culture or environment. And of course the water, uh, both the iron schematic and the water were images found 
free on the internet. Uh, the importance here is that archives have become available, you know, and, and we can tap those archives for images, we can tap them for text, and we can tap them uh, uh, for, uh, for architectural drawings and things like that. So the image, the basic image was totally from archives available online. The schematic, we had to do a lot of work with the steam iron schematic and getting it down the scale and, and, and so forth. And blow, first blowing it up because the schematic image that we found in a particular archive was so small, we had to scale it up and then do some repair on the drawing part of it. So uh, this was done a few years ago, not within the last year, but it's just indicative of how much digital imagery and digital media tools are available. The next slide, uh, this color piece by Sam Gilliam, was actually a piece produced in 1975. Sam Gilliam was actually our first visiting artist in out of town. And we hosted him in 1975. And he did this print with Sahikin, which is a silkscreen print. And Sam came to us a couple of years ago and said, you know, I like to re I love that print. I like to reimagine it differently. Can we do it again? And I, I said, Sam, we don't reproduce things. You said, well, I'm not talking about a reproduction. What I'm talking about is like, can we reimagine? I, I said, well, then let's try this. Let's photograph it digitally. Let's take it and turn it into color separations. The original one was 11 colors. We turned it into, we figured out the best way to do it and make it a little bit different was do nine colors. We did a nine color separation from a digital camera image. And then we put that image into a CNC cutter, a computer numerical cutter at the workshop of Alexis Nutini, who is a master woodcut artist who uses a CNC cutter. And we turned this into a 12 print portfolio, limited edition portfolio, where the changes that we made was number one, the first one was a Silk screen, the second one was woodcut. You're gonna get a difference in the color. Uh, you, you get a, a, a surface quality to it. It's different from the silk screen. But when you take the nine woodcuts, individual wood blocks that were made to make the image again, you have the choice of changing the color and you have a choice of changing the sequence. So we didn't attempt to reprint this image. We attempted to do a variation on it. And so the, First two digital tools was the digital camera and then the Adobe software and then the digital cutter. And then the third way that we finished this off was Sam looked at the finished print and said, you know, I wanna change it a little bit more. So he cut, he designed a cutout that was a rectangle down towards the bottom of the image, horizontal image. And he said, cut that out and turn it 180 degrees. Well, we knew we couldn't do that by hand and let it line up because there would be some variation in the scene when you put it back. So what we decided to do, we knew a picture framer that had a mat cutter, a computer controlled mat cutter. So we took it to him and only for a few dollars each print, he cut it out with his digital mat cutter. And then we turned it around 180 degrees and put it back in there. So in reimagining this print, we utilized the tools that didn't exist in 1975, digital camera software, CNC cutter, and uh, computer uh, assisted uh, mat cutter. Uh, next slide, please, Thomas. Okay, this is another image or a couple of images from Alexis Nutini's workshop. Okay. One of the great things about Alexis, he's a master printer. He's also a master artist. He's very, very good and, 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 and very passionate about this medium. And so we invited, uh, this is Tim McFarland's print. Tim McFarland is a local painter. And we saw in this and his work, the possibility of doing the same thing we did with Sam. Cut a number of blocks for certain colors looking at one original image, but then changing it around, changing the sequence in which we print those blocks and changing the colors that the blocks are printed in. And sometimes mm -hmm. if you do five colors for an image, you might only print three colors to get a variation. So what now we're doing is, instead of concentrating on an edition that's perfected from one to 50 or 30 or whatever the edition number is and be proficient at that, 
is to loosen up a little bit and say, well, all the editions don't, it doesn't have to be a precise edition as far as the image. It can be a variation. So now what we're doing is, and we're going to create our own definition of what a variable print edition is. Going over to the, the image on the right about Thea Murphy Price from Tennessee, we see again uh, a number of woodcut blocks printed in different sequences in different colors and maybe one or two colors out of the total number of blocks. I, I'm not sure it may have been five colors here, but you can print three, four or five. So the, the number of variations is expansive. And in this one, what we, we, we realize is that maybe they're more interesting as an installation, you know? And so we present it here as an installation, but in fact, these are separate editions. But the other thing with variable editions and what we're concentrating on now is reducing the number in addition. We've had in the past, we'd have editions of 100, artists get 50, we get 50 because we split the edition. And sometimes the artists would take their part of the edition and they would hand color, they'd add them, they'd enhance them. Uh, so we'd rather that be done where that part is shared. So if the artist wants to enhance it, you know, we kind of want at least a sample of what that enhancement is going to look like. But over time, over the decades, we've just decided that it's best to print less and give the artist more opportunity to experiment and, and maybe innovate a little bit. Next slide. Alan, okay. what do you yeah, see Daddy. as what do you see as uh, the value of um, variable additions over the? Well, one of the things is. That's a good question, Patty, because one of the things is, it's always been this way for decades. If you get a printer into the workshop, they most likely are gonna play it a little bit safe. They wanna demonstrate to you how proficient they are at printmaking. Whereas when you get a painter, a sculptor, a ceramicist that doesn't have a lot of experience or don't claim to be expert at it or proficient at it, uh, they're much looser. You know, Sam Gilliam, I'm showing Sam because Sam is, you know, he's one of our first artists and over decades, he's continued to make prints with us. And he's like Romare Beard. He doesn't aspire for perfection. Sam was doing variable editions in the eighties when he'd come in and we print something and he said, let's cut it up and let's rearrange the parts. And, and then he'd, he'd go get some acrylic and a squeegee or a brush. And he, you know, he would uh, hand color certain sections of the print. So in the fact, if we did an edition of 38, each 38, each one of those 38 would be different because of the hand work that he would do on it. You know, the squeegeeing or the brush strokes or whatever. Uh, and so what we find is that, you know, we get more experimentation and we get more interest in doing something different with non printmakers because they're more open and they're more receptible to direction from the master printer, you know. The master printer can pull out the drawer and show them all these different prints they've done and say, here's some of your options, you know, and they're open to that, you know, not to say that every printmaker wasn't open. I mean, we've had many people like John Dow who come in and he's a master tamaran master printer and he would be open to try something with the colors or the certain looks and, you know, so this is what we value in Brandywine Workshop is that you don't come to us and try to reproduce your aesthetic in a print, but you do a print that helps think about, reimagine your aesthetic in print. Stan Whitney is a perfect example. Sam, Stan, uh, Stan, yeah, Stan Whitney. Stan is, is doing very well in New York now. His work is selling for hundreds of thousands of dollars. But when he came to us in 1980 as one of our first or earliest visiting artists, uh, he didn't know what, what he could do with printmaking. And we just said, well, just draw, draw on my law, you know? And in some respects, he said it helped him change his thinking about his paintings. So that's what we look for, you know, not to reproduce something, but to reimagine what you do in another medium in a print. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, here's uh, one of the continuing projects we're doing with Sam Gilliam now. Uh, Sam gave us a watercolor. We did a digital photograph of it. And then we did a color separation. 
I'm not sure uh, of the exact number. I think it was maybe maybe seven or eight different woodcuts on these uh, the separation of the color print, uh, color watercolor was. And Sam's goal was to make some really powerful and different black and white paintings. As you know, he's Sam is abstract expressionist. He's a, a, very much about color, but he also sees color in black and white. And so this is Alexis Nutini, who is the proprietor master printer at Dull Straits Press here in South Philadelphia, not far from the workshop. And uh, he does some amazing work. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, we printed the uh, Wissahickon portfolio uh, in 19, uh, 2019, 2020. And this is our project, which started in uh, 2020 and is ongoing now, we're in 2021. So sometimes these projects may take six months or longer, but what he's doing here is, it's not a variable addition, even though it's using the same plates, each one is to be different. So they're monoprints. And some of these images are being trimmed and pushed together to make, a, a, you'd call it a, a diptych because it had two panels, but it's really you know, to be, be looked at and perceived as one large image because Sam, you know, is really drawn to scale. Uh, but Alexis is an amazing printer and uh, he, um, he had a one person show with us a couple of years ago. And uh, we're very happy that the artists that are the master printers also are very uh, talented and, and they do their work as well. And I think that contributes to, to the collaboration. When you have a printer that's not just a printer, but he's truly an artist as well, I think it really contributes to the understanding the function that, that happens during the process uh, with that. Next slide, please. Okay, this is Nicole Donnelly, a uh, paper think tank in Philadelphia. And uh, she's another partner with us uh, as we outsource some of our printing to increase capacity and extend the notion uh, of what a print could be. So here we have, uh, uh, I, it's not shown on the slide, I'm sorry about that, but Numi Nam is from, uh, I think the University of Kansas and she's our visiting artist for 2021. This, uh, she specializes in book arts and this is a mold that was made, handmade paper in Nicole's workshop, pressed into the mold and uh, you get the form shown there uh, in the white in the top right. To the, uh, this is, I think this is gonna ultimately be an installation too, where the finished work on top of the book, the artwork that goes on top will be variable. And then there'll be an installation of uh, eight to 12 or whatever uh, images. But uh, she's like an installation art. She thinks paper, but she thinks in three dimension and she's a printmaker. To the right, this blue sheet of paper here, is handmade paper for Diedrich Brackens. Diedrich is a weaver. He does his art off a loom and she, he's based in Los Angeles. And uh, so Nicole has created colored handmade paper. You have the lighter blue and you have the darker blue. And then you, you, you press them together, you know, and you get one sheet with two colors. Now, Alexis Nutini from Paper Think Tank is going to print two colors over top of it to complete the addition. But it's a combination of handmade paper, which is colored to bring some of the color into the print. And then there'll be two colors printed over top in relief. Next slide, please. Okay, here's another example uh, of how Brandywine is trying to get people to rethink, reimagine what a print really is and how does it function? How is it you know, experience in, in a physical, uh, its physical existence. So the one on the left and, and one on the right are two examples of a project being done by uh, Vanessa German of Pittsburgh. And I should say that all these projects are being done remote because we haven't had access to virtual uh, process, but it's, it's remote. The artists have not come to Philadelphia. And because they don't come, we save the money from the hotel and the transportation, this is because of COVID. So this is one of the big impacts of COVID. We couldn't do in-person workshops. So what we decided to do, the money that was set aside for the travel and hotel could be added to their production budget and they could think bigger or broader, you know. 
Uh, so Vanessa chose to do seven suits for seven days. And uh, it was printed by Galen, who's a lithographer and a, um, uh, a screen printer. Uh, and he has, a lot of his training was in Europe. He went to Tyler School of Art. Now he's in Philadelphia. So he's a master printer at lithography. He printed this on rag paper. She, he shipped it to Vanessa in Pittsburgh. She had her uh, patterns already laid out and they started cutting in pattern. The goal here is to create seven suits for seven days to be worn in a performance will happen as a conclusion to her project. But she's also, because whenever you do something like this, you always have extra. So out of the extra, we'll get some collages. So the collages will be split. Randy Wine will have collages for its permanent collection, as well as some to sell. And as far as the suits, we'll get one, one suit. I think the edition is like six or something like that. We'll get one suit for our permanent collection and she will be able to keep the rest uh, because you know, printmaking is flat. We got flat storage box uh, files uh, and we wouldn't wanna have this installed and then have to store it. So we only need one. And this way, she's put a lot of her time and her studio energy and staff into finishing this project off. So the collaboration goes from the artist to the printer and back to the artist studio. Uh, next slide. Okay, all right, so that's to catch you up on some of the things that we're doing in the workshop. Uh, we're looking at printmaking extended. We're looking at printmaking, not just innovation, but invention, you know? And I, I think we're moving closer to, to that point where it will brand, Brandywine is the workshop to do something that is, uh, involves the print, pr printmaking medium but doesn't necessarily confine itself to two dimension. Now we have this year, we have uh, an artist, uh, local artist, Colette Fu, who's expert at book art and pop-up books, internationally known for pop-up books. She's gonna start a project with us uh, because she's local, we can stretch the time out. Um, that's gonna be a, a pop-up uh, or collapsible form of art that will be three feet wide and probably four feet high. She has done pieces that have been as large as 17 feet wide by 10 feet high. And so you, when you get to scale, you start to command space, you know, the consciousness of its physicality and how it affects the space that it's presented in. So we, we will do an exhibition of her work when it's complete that will have a finished piece, but we'll also have like, stages of development, you know. So these are some of the things we're doing and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to continue to attract artists who, who value printmaking as an expressive medium and, and, and wanna work with us. I'm sure you will, Ellen. Um, I just wanted to ask you, what has been the most significant impact of the pandemic on Brandywine's programming? Yeah, I, I partially covered that with the idea of remote residencies. Uh, we, can, we can still do the local residencies, but even that because of contact and, and social distancing, uh, we've kept those remote as well. Uh, the beauty is that on occasion though, because the person is local, they might decide, look, I'm gonna drive into the master printer studio and take a look at the progress or, or try to make some decisions direct. Um, and so the advantage of pushing the work out to these workshops, which generally it's one person or maybe an assistant, you have the space to, to, to be protective, to be safe and so forth. Um, so that's been good. Um, do, do I know the, the, gallery, the gallery has been closed. Do you think yeah. it's opening at any yeah, time? Yeah, the, the gallery has been closed. We open, uh, Behind me is two pieces, one by Elana Sui and one by um, Alvin Loving. The gallery's been closed since March of 2020, um, and we don't plan to reopen until uh, at the earliest September of this year. Um, so as a result, we had written a grant application the year before all this happened with the pandemic 
to start doing some virtual exhibitions curated with independent curators. So we, we did get funded for that. We're working with a few independent curators to do that. Um, and we're thinking more about how we can do virtual gallery uh, tours uh, from the exhibitions that, that we've had or exhibitions we'll put up. So we, we the, it's funny, the, the impact has been negative in that you don't have that interaction with people, uh, either in the workshop, in the galleries, people coming to the lecture, but it kind of accelerated things that we were thinking we needed to do anyhow. And that is command more space in digital space, become prominent in digital space, because Brandywine has always thought of itself as a national or international organization by the right of what we, who we bring in to do things with. Um, all traveling exhibitions have been canceled, but that was a major part of what we did. Uh, 35 countries, 35 states and all, that has been taken away. Um, but um, overall, the, the main loss, I think, is that, that person, that, that social interaction with people. Uh, but uh, we did develop, as you began in the presentation, talking about the Artur Teacher Guide and Artur.org website. That yeah, had been well, I wanted to ask you about that because that's been your baby this year and yeah. uh, ready to go. Yeah, well, that was 10 years in development. And the only way we got it to launch was we sold some prints to Harvard Art Museums that gave us the money to engage our web builder and designer. And so we were ready to roll January, uh, July 1 of last year. But when the pandemic shut down everything in March, we accelerated and we went right to, to launch by March 20th because we knew more eyes were gonna be on the internet. Teachers were looking for resources. And uh, this was before we got into the moment of social justice and racial justice. And it became important to have things online that reflected the diversity and the richness of, of our community nationally as well as locally. So um, in, a, in a way, the, uh, you know, the, the people paid, the last year people, governments, city, state and federal and foundations have paid more attention to the needs of the disadvantaged, be the individuals or they be art organizations, which were being starved of income because most income was go, goes to the majors, right? And so that infusion of CARES Act and COVID money has really helped us to maintain our staff. We haven't laid anybody off, you know? So uh, there were a lot of positives. Um, and of course, people like David Driscoll and other people, people lost their lives during this, this pandemic was, was horrific and, and depressing. But um, I think, you know, for me personally, every time I see a work of art, I, I know the artists that did it. And I think back to the time that I knew them or the time they were in the studio. So art is a way of memorializing or capturing moments uh, that you can lean to when, when, when you're depressed or you're mourning you know, the loss of someone. Uh, I don't know if, if you have some other questions about that. I, 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 I kind of weigh, let, let me just say this before I go back to you, Patty. There's opportunity out there. That's what people got to remember. Then in the worst of situations, like yin yang, for every cause there's reaction, for every reaction there's a cause. And we're in a moment now where creativity should be just in bloom because there's so much to think about and, and to inspire, you know, as well as depress, you know? You know? So in, in funding is, is in a shift, the thinking about who you fund, what you fund, and our operations now, we'll never go back to being only in person. When I mentioned about digital spaces, it's also the fact that we will have transitioned into our hybrid situation where we put extreme effort in what we produce and share over the internet, as well as what we continue to do in, in, in our uh, live programming. Go ahead. Well, I just wanted to know what you see as the vision for Brandywine going far forward. Well, that's part of what I, I hope I, you know, I explained um, is that going forward, we're going to always have limitations now uh, on in person. We're going we think about it differently, but it's going to be important 
that we have that prominence in the digital space that someone goes on not even looking for us, find us, you know, but certainly teachers, uh, professors in college teaching art history, art education, arts management, uh, you know, students uh, will know about Brandywine and hopefully include it in their lectures in the curriculum. And then uh, if you're an art education major, when you graduate, you'll have that in your toolbox that Brandywine is a resource that you can use to teach your school, teach, your, teach in the classroom. And so we're gonna produce a teacher guide every year. Last year, we included the section on language arts, reimagining history and math and art. This year, we're gonna do a deeper dive into language art and reimagining history. And we're gonna do a section on art and music. Uh, so it'll be a, a new insert uh, and it'll be a deeper dive in some of the older topics that we discussed in the earlier ones. Um, but going forward, um, you know, we need to look at leadership transition. We're at that half century mark. And, um, you know, uh, my transition, uh, adding new leadership will add a, a, a change to the, to the way we operate in, in future vision. But the board has a five year plan and uh, we're trying to implement that plan, which would include, uh, you know, some, some, some new, I think some exciting programs. I should say also in the future, uh, in March, uh, there'll be a major announcement for a major exhibition in March at a, at a university. And uh, we're looking forward to being able to announce that because there'll be a lot of virtual programming with that as well. Uh, so we just, we just want to keep expanding, increasing our audience and working with affinity groups, National Art Education Association, Association of Print Scholars, American Council of Printmaking. Um, you know, there's, there's groups out there where we can connect with, provide these services online, school groups, school districts across the country we're working with, and have a, a broader reach and impact and, in, and substantially increased audience uh, for the things that we think uh, are worth sharing. Alan, have you gotten much feedback from uh, educators who have used Artura yet? We've had tremendous feedback. We have a national advisory group, which we uh, branded as a virtual institute for inclusion, diversity, and equity in arts and education. We call it IDEA. And uh, it's a virtual uh, institute. And its members represent places like University of Notre Dame, Arizona State University, University of Texas, Austin, Rhode Island School Design Museum, National Gallery. You know, I could go on and on. There's about 24 members. And then we have uh, within that, some of those members are also uh, curators and staff at, we have 16 satellite collections around the country. So um, we're looking to expand that in the next five years to 24 institutions and have one in every major urban area to, across the country. So, so at this point, it's like, if you become a brand new wine visiting artist, if you get selected and you become a brand new wine visiting artist and you do good work, you can end up in the collection of one of these institutions. Uh, you could end up or would end up on our database, the artur.org database. You'd get videotaped, there'd be documentation of you and your work. Uh, so there's a lot more, a lot added benefit to coming and making a printed brand new one, particularly if you concentrate on doing something that's strong, something you're gonna be proud of and something we're gonna be proud of. Uh, so I don't know if that answers your question, but. Uh, it does, you know, we haven't talked at all about the, um, about the archives and the, mm -hmm. you know, the shop. Maybe some yeah. of our viewers would be interested in knowing how to purchase uh, prints from Brandywine. Okay. Archives first. Our archives, there's a couple of things. We've got the records for every artist that ever participated. If we see something, an artist sends us a catalog, we see something in the media, we capture it. We're not all digital. We, you know, Alan Evans believes in paper backup, okay? So at some point, that some of that material will get digitized. We also have a book library where people like the scholar and curator Ruth Fine contribute books uh, other artists contribute books and scholars contribute books to our library. And we try to focus on printmaking and contemporary art. The um, 
print collection is divided into two sections. One is the visiting artist selection, and the other is print collections that were of, of work that was not produced at Brand One. Sometimes an artist, like we had artists come from Japan, uh, she gave us some prints. Uh, Edgar Heeperberg gave us some prints. Uh, Juan Sanchez, because they liked what we were doing, they wanted to be in that collection, permanent collection, which includes the prints made here as well as the prints that were donated to us or exchanged. Years ago, I knew the founding director of Self Help Graphics in Los Angeles, and you know, uh, it was our both our vision. We studied at Tyler together to start a print workshop. So at a certain point, we said, let's exchange prints. She sent us 30 prints. We sent her 30 prints. Bob Blackburn, who was a mentor uh, and a big supporter of Brandywine, um, you know, when he passed, he left in his will that he wanted prints from his collection in, in the Bob Blackburn workshop to go to Brandywine. So we have almost 200 prints from the Bob Blackburn personal collection and that of the workshop. We, um, we also have a collection of 30 prints that were uh, given to us we, for four years. We used to do a workshop uh, residency in, in collaboration with this uh, experimental print workshop in the old city in Havana, Cuba. And uh, so we have a collection of that work. And then in 20, uh, uh, 1999, we brought four of their prominent printmakers to Philly, and they produced prints. Uh, one of them, Dalka Sayon, you know, worked at uh, University of Arts here in Philly. And uh, so we have that permanent collection, which is so rich, you know, it goes beyond the visiting artist collection. All that is being put up on the website, and uh, we're looking to continue to do that work, documenting what is already in Brandywine's collection, but also assisting in working with other groups to get their collections into the database. Uh, because uh, like I said, it took us 10 years to plan this. It's taken hundreds of thousands of dollars to develop it and launch it. And most groups don't have that resource. So we wanna extend that platform out to them and, and, and help them document, promote and preserve what they've done as well. Um, Alan, you want to talk a little bit about the the um, print shop, the print? Oh, okay. Purchasing. I didn't talk about the print. That was the second question. Right. Okay. The what 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 did you want to know about the print shop specifically, Patty? Well, just that um, people can purchase prints online. Oh, right, right, right. Okay. Thank you, Patty, for reminding me. Um, one of the ways that Brandywine funds its operations is through print sales. So when an artist comes here as a visiting artist, they get it. The agreement is they pay for nothing. We pay for everything and they get to keep half the edition. We keep the other half and we use ours to sell, uh, place some in our permanent collection. So that will always be there. And then we invite the curators from these satellite collections to come in and pick and curate for their collections, uh, which is a gift purchase. They buy some, we give some. Uh, we have now a uh, launch last fall. We have an e-commerce website called brandywine.art. So if you go to www.brandywine.art, you'll be able to look at the prints that we have for sale. Uh, and that income really helps the fund, particularly the vision artist residencies, because you always have to have matching funds. Uh, and that's, that's been a great, a great resource of earned income for us. Uh, so I encourage you, uh, if you want to get a, a really good buy, I mean, as a publisher, you're probably not going to find it anywhere, uh, I don't want to say cheaper, but less valued for sale than the publisher. Because once the artist takes their work, they have their audience, they have their patrons, they have their galleries, or they have the friends and people they know they buy their work and they might increase the price. We, we're usually behind that. We only uh, kind of increase the price every so often when we note that there's been uh, higher valuations for, for those prints and the artist's work. And that's all done with agreement with, with the artist. So uh, if you, you know, let me just say this, we got three websites. One is brandywineworkshopandarchives.org where you can go and learn the history, the background of Brandywine. Uh, if you're interested in applying, 
the, the process and the deadlines for applying for fellowships, uh, national and then the local fellowships. We have two of those, um, uh, the Libby Newman and the Joyce de Guadalamala Fellowship of Philadelphia Artists and excludes any funds for, for travel and hotel because people have to live you know, local and be able to get themselves to the workshop and back. Um, and then we have uh, our tour.org, which is our image library and database. And we're working constantly on that. It's an organic kind of thing because uh, to, to do the work, to format, write descriptions, put metadata in, um, and we try to make it authentic, you know, we try to keep it as authentic as possible. So rather than us describe the artwork that we're showing, we ask them when an artist comes to produce the work that they leave us a, a description of whatever that work is about to them. Uh, so some of those didn't, and we're trying to track it down and get a description and where we can't, because perhaps a person might pass, we go to their statements in catalogs, brochures, interviews, and things like that. So it's a lot of research that's getting done uh, to make all that stuff ready to publish on the front end of the website. Uh, and then the last one is what I mentioned about brandywine.art, which is the e-commerce site. Um, I should say that we're also planning uh, for any artists out there that, that have worked with us and they, they feel uh, a sense of, uh, gratitude or whatever, whatever we may have done. Uh, we're planning an auction uh, in New York for the fall. We'll probably be at a couple of auction houses, but we are planning that as a fundraiser. Uh, looking forward, we're trying to create some endowed positions at Brandywine. So we're, we're doing over the next five years, we could do, be doing some major fundraising to create that, that endowment fund. Speaking of fundraising, did you wanna mention though a little premature, the gala? Oh yeah. Well, if you want to, I'm I'm very hopeful that we'll be able to travel by October 15th of 2022, which is our 50th anniversary, and uh, it's going to be at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. We're hoping to bring back honorees that we couldn't honor last week, last uh, March because it was canceled due to the pandemic. We were honoring Kishasha Conwell. Coleman Conwell from the National Museum of African American Art, Rasheed Johnson, a painter from Brooklyn, and Willie Cole, uh, who I mentioned earlier, a uh, 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 sculptor from North Jersey. Uh, those are the three honorees we didn't have a chance to honor. We hope to bring them back for recognition, as well as as many former honorees as, as we can, and then honor new people, you know, uh, somebody in a studio artist, a curator, art historian, and the third honoree will be a uh, art educator. So uh, we're looking forward to that. There'll be special exhibition in the gallery and uh, a lot of things surrounding that, um, that event. So if you look at a long-term calendar, put us down for October 15th, 2022 and uh, join us at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Patty. Well, no more I, questions? I, okay. I hope uh, everybody's enjoyed this. Um, I know I learned something new every time Alan talks about Brandywine. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. And if you have any questions, you can email us at print at Brandywine Workshop dot com and we'll try to answer your questions before or during the next artists and conversation uh, event uh, and be sure to visit the bread website uh, thomas you can put that slide up there with the websites and um if you want to be a member of brandywine you can join via the website uh, brandywine um, workshop and archives and support this ongoing, very valuable organization. The membership uh, information is on the homepage, brandywineworkshopandarchives.org. You can also, if you don't want to take a membership, but you want to make a contribution, you can do it uh, or just by clicking the button, donate at the top of that website. So, uh, and, and share with your friends. If you know somebody who's looking to start out in collecting, 
um, and a little bit afraid uh, for whatever reason, feeling uncomfortable with the knowledge or not sure uh, about valuations. Um, you know, you can match what you see on the um, e-commerce site, brandywine.art, with what the information provided at artur.org, uh, which gives you great information on the background of the artist uh, and their achievements in the field. Uh, so, uh, and then, you know, our, you see at the bottom there, our email is prints at brandywineworkshop.com. So if you have any questions or you have any suggestions for themes for future pod, uh, future sessions going forward, we hope to do this every month on a Thursday at this time, the third Thursday at this time. And um, we just invite you to let us know your thoughts and maybe there's some needs out there that need to be addressed that, that we can, you know, can look at and find some solutions for. So again, I thank you. I thank you, Patty, for, for doing this. And uh, I thank you, Thomas uh, uh, Kelly, for, for taking care of the tech, technical aspects of this and uh, wish everybody well. Thank you. Thanks, Alan.